Mary, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow and the next day and next year and a year after that. I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet and I'm going to see the world. See the world. It's a wonderful life will not be seen this year. In its place is the following. Merry Christmas everyone, I am the Kaji no Kami, and today I'm going to share with you a very special review. You see, 25 years ago today, a theatrical film that was made to coincide with Batman the Anime Series was released in theaters. As such, I thought it would only be fitting to share with you Mask of the Phantasm. Batman has had an interesting history dating back to when a legal criminal by the name of Bob Kane used his dad's knowledge of copyright law in order to take full credit for the creation of the character regardless of who worked with him on it. We have had many iterations of the character in both comics, movies, and television with a wide array of tones and adaptations. Sometimes we have dark and broody, sometimes over the top comedic. Whatever the case may be, DC doesn't stray too far from their flagship character, whom they seem to think needs to babysit their entire universe in today's world. DC, the house that Batman built. Nevertheless, after the success of Tim Burton's film in 1989, Warner Brothers and DC wanted to relaunch Batman to the world in animated form and hired a couple of Tiny Toons writers, such as Bruce Tim and Paul Dini, to helm the show. After a grandstanding pilot, the show was greenlit for the Fox Kids Network and became an instant hit. The first season consisted of 65 episodes that spanned various stories featuring all kinds of characters from the comics, be it the big leagues like the Joker, Two-Face, Penguin, and Catwoman, to lesser known criminals such as Rupert Thorne, Dr. Milo, and the terrible trio. What was even more outstanding than the series' characters was its voice cast. Kevin Conroy brought a superb gruffy Batman voice to go with his nonchalant Bruce Wayne that was assisted with top-notch talents such as Efren Zimbalist Jr. as Alfred, Bob Hastings as Commissioner Gordon, Star Wars as Mark Hamill as the Joker, John Glover as the Riddler, Ron Perlman as Clayface, Andrea Barbeau as Catwoman, and many, many others I could spend hours talking about. Additionally, the show did direct adaptations to some of Batman's famous comic stories from the 70s, including the first foray between Batman and the enigmatic Raz El Ghul. Father's name was pronounced Raish, not Raz. Sorry. A common mistake. Of course, to not mention how they evolved Mr. Freeze into something more than a goon and created the extremely popular Harley Quinn would be an insult. <laughs> You're really sick, you know that, boss? Mm -hmm. No matter how you look at it, Batman the Animated Series was by far the most influential Batman adaptation to ever grace audiences. As such, it was bound to have a feature length film which originally started out as a direct-to-video movie, only for the show's success to catapult it into a theatrical feature. Mask of the Phantasm was released to the box office on Christmas Day in 1993 and is to this date the greatest Batman movie ever. Ever. Some of you are probably thinking, well, that's a bold statement to make considering it's animated, as if that should matter. Whether it's animated or not is irrelevant. What matters is the quality of writing. Nevertheless, why do I think Mask of the Phantasm is the greatest Batman movie of all time? Well, let's watch to find out. Mask of the Phantasm kicks off with Batman interrupting a meeting with a bunch of gangsters working on a counterfeit ring. The head honcho, Chucky Soul, flees the scene only to be greeted by what looks to be the ghost of Christmas future, or as we know him as, Phantasm. Your angel of death awaits. You ain't the bat! Congratulations! Did you figure that out on your own? Chucky meets his maker, which is naturally blamed on Batman by one of Gotham's top politicians, Councilman Arthur Reeves. I'm telling you, friends, it's vigilantism at its deadliest. How many times are we gonna let Batman cross the line? That night, Bruce Wayne is hosting a party when Arthur asks him about his love life, specifically referencing a woman he knows is coming into town after 10 years named Andrea Beaumont, voiced by Dana Delaney, who would go on to voice Lois Lane in the eventual Superman animated adaptation. Now there was a sweet number. How'd you let her get loose? Thanks for the handkerchief, Arthur. You know where you can stick it. This leads to Bruce remembering his first meeting with Andrea when he was at the cemetery speaking to his parents, and she was doing the same to her mother. With all that money and power, how come you always look like you want to jump off a cliff? Why should you care? I don't. Mother was asking. Alrighty then. Bruce, she's a little bit crazy. That night, Bruce puts on a ski mask and fails at his first attempt to halt a robbery. 
your stomachs. Arms spread. Who's this clown? You heard me. Yeah, you heard him, boys. While he does end up stopping it in the end, it leaves him slightly injured. Oh. Andrea shows up at his doorstep, wanting to know why he hasn't called her. You expect every guy you meet to call you up? Ha! The ones that are smart enough to dial a phone. Entitled much? We return to the present day where another gangster, Buzz Bronski, is putting flowers on Chucky's tombstone when he too is visited by our mysterious phantasm. All right, creep. Catch this! <laughs> He sends Buzz to infinity and beyond! Yet again, Batman is blamed for this. Arthur demands Commissioner Gordon helps him. His response? Batman does not kill. Unless you take into account this. <laughs> and this. And this. I won't kill you. But I don't have to save you. And this one. Okay, you can kind of give some leeway to that one, but man, these live action movies just don't understand Batman at all, do they? Batman investigates the murder scene before stopping to visit his parents' grave when he comes across Andrea. Bruce? Oh my god! It took her 30 seconds to deduce what some people couldn't figure out over 30 years. Congratulations, woman! You are as smart as you are insane. Later, Andrea has dinner with Arthur, which Batman has to spy on in order to bring up another flashback segment. This time of he and Andrea going to a World's Fair that is supposed to showcase the city's future. So according to this fair, dinner will now be made by robots with a stool for a leg. <laughs> while Christmas carolers will look like the robots from Metropolis. Also, Bruce sees a car that will inspire the design of the Batmobile. Bruce? Even though he wasn't the one who designed the Batmobile, as we saw in the episode The Mechanic. I need a new car. It took me six months to come up with the design specs alone. Titanium construction. A blade of skin cowling. Whatever, I guess you could just say that maybe that mechanic dude was the one who designed that car in the first place? Possible, I guess, but still kind of weird that they show Bruce get the design from there. Afterwards, Andrea takes Bruce to meet her dad, but their fun is interrupted by some shady looking dudes that come in demanding an audience with him. Mr. Velestra says he has an appointment, Virginia, then Mr. Velestra has an appointment. That's what I like about your pop kiddo. He knows his priority. Bruce and Andrea leave, only to witness a robbery in progress, which Bruce tries to stop, and fails yet again. <laughs> Ugh, I'm bad at this. Bruce laments his future. It's gotta be one or the other. I can't have it both ways. I can't put myself on the line as long as there's someone waiting for me to come home. Hey, hey! So this is where Dan Didiot got his modern day DC philosophy from. He visits his parents' grave asking for forgiveness when Andrea arrives to comfort him. He proposes to her just as a string of bats emerge from a cavern beneath the manor. The next day, as Bruce is checking out this cavern, Alfred hands him his engagement ring with a goodbye letter from Andrea, which sets him off to becoming Batman. During this time in the present, another former partner in crime of Chucky and Buzz, Sale Valestra, voiced by the Godfather's Abe Vigoda, goes to visit an old friend we're all too familiar with. 
No way is anybody gonna hurt my pal Sal. That's what I want to see. A nice big smile. Later, Phantasm sneaks into Sal's home to kill him, only to find a nice Christmas surprise. Not Batman after all. The place blows up and Batman tackles Phantasm. Stay away. This is not your fight. This madness ends now. Their duel is disrupted by the police who effortlessly pursue Batman until Andrea picks him up to take him home before he can be apprehended. She divulges the truth to him about why she originally rejected his marriage proposal. If I don't pay him back within 24 hours, they'll find us and they'll kill us both. We hid all over Europe. After spending some time together, she leaves, and Bruce makes a startling revelation with a picture he had acquired earlier of her father and the gangsters. Oh no. Joker visits Arthur. That's right, Hearty. Bring in the press, why don't you? What a photo op! The councilman and his wacky pal! He tells the crooked councilman about Phantasm. He looks more like the ghost of Christmas future. Hey! That's what I said! Copycat. Just then, Andrea calls, flickering on the light bulbs in Joker's attic. Now ain't that a co-winky dick? <sighs> We're talking about the old man and the spawn of his loins just happens to call. He poisons Arthur with killer laughing gas, which gets worse as Batman interrogates him in the hospital, learning the truth. I was running out of money and asked Beaumont for help. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> so you sold him to the mob. We see another quick flashback from Andrea's perspective of when she returned home one day from shopping and saw our pre-Joker gangster leaving the property. But he paid you. Dad? Ah! Phantasm appears before Joker. I'm impressed, lady. You're harder to kill than a cockroach on steroids. So you figured it out. What? Andrea was the Phantasm the entire time? Seriously, though, um... This could have been a cool plot twist, could have been amazing, except there's one little tiny problem about it that occurred back in 1993. For those of you who weren't born then, the toy came out before the movie and had the Phantasm mask packaged separately from Andrea. Therefore, anyone who saw the toy knew who Phantasm's identity was before the film came out. That was dumb. Moving on, Andrea tries to battle Joker, he runs away, Batman saves her, and then he goes after the Joker. This leads to an awesome kaiju-like fight in a miniature Gotham City. Joker sets the place to blow and is stopped. Andrea disappears with the Joker as the ruins of the World's Fair asunder. Andrea! Batman escapes. He mopes about her death until learning she is still alive. Bringing an end to our masterpiece as Batman continues his patrol of Gotham City. What a fantastic film this was. Hell, what a phenomenal Batman adaptation this was. This is the first time we truly got to see Batman be both a hero 
and a detective all in one shot. It seems like a lot of the other movies gloss over the detective work to have Batman save people, forgetting that he is also supposed to be the world's greatest detective. It also helps that Kevin Conroy knows how to pull off both personas Bruce Wayne and Batman as two separate individuals despite being the same person. This is another area where the live action films fail at, as they will either have an actor who plays a fantastic Batman or an actor playing a fantastic Bruce Wayne, yet never both. Of course, the entire voice cast is stellar from our show regulars to the likes of Stacey Keach and Abe Vigoda. Mark Hamill is exceptional in this one, as this is one of the few times he actually truly got to portray the Joker in a manner that was fitting to his ruthless comic persona. I've always felt that outside of the Laughing Fish, Hamill was never really able to capture the essence of Joker due to TV restrictions. Here, he goes all out, and it is simply his finest moment. It also helps that the story and characters are a well-written, engaging experience as there is never a dull moment. What is even more impressive is how much plot and development they were able to pull off from a 76 minute movie. There is more substance here than we sometimes get out of a 2 plus hour film. Anyone that dismisses this movie simply because it is animated is not only doing everyone who worked on it an injustice, but even themselves. It'd be funny if it weren't so pathetic. Speaking of the animation, the entire series for its original 85 episode run and this movie were animated using negative effect, meaning it was colored on black paper instead of white paper. That alone also manages to give the show a tone not found in other cartoons before, during, and after it. The darkest adaptation of Batman ever made. Literally the darkest, because they drew it on black paper. It has a very film noir feel. The opening shot of the film was done in CGI, and it does not look dated one bit compared to the other series and movies that use CGI shots during the 90s, which is also remarkable. Add on top an impressive score from series composer Shirley Walker, and you have one of the best Batman soundtracks available, be it the operatic chanting in the opening, the GCPD's pursuit of Batman, or the music as the World's Fair burns into oblivion, The music is just splendid all around. All of what I have just said is exactly why Mask of the Phantasm is hands down the greatest Batman movie ever. If you have never seen it before, go and check it out right now. Now is the perfect time to do so since it has been given a phenomenal Blu-ray release. Hell, the entire series is worth checking out on Blu-ray as each episode feels like a mini movie. No Batman adventure will ever be able to top this show and this movie, no matter what. It doesn't matter if it's live action or animated. This is the best adaptation ever. Until next time, enjoy your Christmas dinner. Bye. Christmas. But Redonda!